The Book of Abraham, Truth or Fiction, presented by Restoration Believer. We believe that Joseph Smith Jr. was a seer, called by God to bring forth the Book of Mormon for the purpose of restoring the covenant to the house of Israel, and witness that Jesus Christ is the eternal God of creation. This documentary is meant to demonstrate that man is fallible. Acknowledging the mistakes of the past is the first step in humility, repentance, and embracing the truth that was revealed to the world when the Book of Mormon was given. This presentation is not meant to weaken faith or prove any religion right or wrong. It is simply offered as the unbiased, factual history of the Restoration Movement and a reminder that we all must be humble in order to not be deceived. The Egyptian civilization and all the discoveries made over the centuries have captured the human imagination and given insights into past cultures. Modern Egyptology began when Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt in 1798. This event sparked considerable European interest in the study of Egyptian antiquities, as Egypt was now available to the Western world. One of these early explorers was Antonio Lobolo. Antonio Lobolo oversaw many archaeological excavations, mainly in the zone of Luxor, Egypt, and had many items in his personal collection. The finest examples of his discoveries are found in the Egyptian Museum of Berlin and the British Museum. It is believed that Lobolo died on February 19, 1830 in Castiglione, Italy. During this same period of 1820 and 1830, a record of the ancient inhabitants of America were revealed to a young man in Palmyra, New York. Joseph Smith was a teenager when he was visited by a heavenly messenger and told of a buried set of records near his home. The records were inscribed on golden plates and preserved to come forth in his day. By the power of God and the use of an ancient device made for the purpose of translating ancient languages, Joseph translated the record into a book. The Book of Mormon was published in March of 1830. Following the translation of the Book of Mormon, the angel took back the plates and interpreters. Joseph continued to produce revelations without the interpreters and led a movement that spawned hundreds of churches since 1830, the largest of which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or what is commonly referred to as the Mormons. In 1835, Joseph Smith was approached by a man named Michael Chandler to sell him some mummies and papyri that he had inherited from his uncle, Antonio Lobolo, the explorer. Chandler had claimed that his uncle had discovered the mummies and papyri while ex excavating in ancient e Egypt in the city of Thebes. He had brought the collection to the United States with hopes to sell them during his travels. The mummies and papyri appeared to be authentic, and Chandler was offering them for a price of $2,400. Joseph had great interest in the collection, particularly a papyri, as he saw the Egyptian writing on it. It is likely that he recognized some of the characters that were found on the plates of the Book of Mormon, which was written in Reformed Egyptian. He knew that Egypt played an important role in biblical history, and as he looked at the scrolls, he felt that it was ancient writings from Abraham. Perhaps he noticed the pictograph shown here, which featured a person in the process of sacrificing another person upon an altar. This, of course, being reminiscent of Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice to God. It is not recorded what he was thinking when they were presented, other than he was very excited and wanted to try to purchase them. Chandler was unwilling to sell only the papyri, and so Joseph had to purchase the whole collection for a price of $2,400 if he wanted them. $2,400 in 1835 was equivalent to $79,717 in 2022 money. The church was struggling financially to build the Kirtland Temple at the time, which wasn't finished until March of 1836. Finding that kind of money was going to be a challenge. He approached the church people and asked them to make sacrifices by loaning and or donating the money so they might obtain these sacred records. The church became very excited to be able to purchase the collection and sacrifices were made. Several members loaned large amounts to the church as well. Finally, on July 6th, 1835, the collection was purchased and Joseph started the translation process. The church people were very busy working out on the Kirtland Temple, but Joseph still dedicated time to the translation. He made multiple journal entries regarding work on the papyri as time progressed. 
On October 1st, 1835, Joseph said, This afternoon labored on the Egyptian alphabet in company with brothers Oliver Cowdery and W.W. W. Phelps. The system of astronomy was unfolded. Then on November 26th, 1835, Joseph said, Thursday, 26th, at home. We spent the day in transcribing Egyptian characters from the papyrus. I am severely afflicted with a cold today. Then on January 30th, 1836, Joseph said he had attended school as usual and showed the papyri to his uh, Hebrew teacher and verified the authenticity. This was the same day that they set up the Quorums of Seventy at the temple. His, uh, his journal entry read as follows. Saturday the 30th, attended school as usual and waited upon several visitors and showed them the record of Abraham. Mr. Joshua Sexus, our Hebrew teacher, examined them with deep interest and pronounced them to be original beyond all doubt. He is a man of excellent understanding and has a knowledge of many languages which were spoken by the ancients. He is an honorable man so far as I can judge as yet. In the evening went to the upper rooms of the Lord's house and set the different quorums in order. Instructed the presidents of seventy concerning the order of their anointing and requested them to proceed and anoint the seventy having set all the quorums in order. Then on February 17th, Joseph said the following, and this is in 1836. This evening, Elder Joseph Coe called to make some arrangements about the Egyptian records and the mummies. He proposes to hire a room at John Johnson's Inn and exhibit them there from day to day at certain hours that some benefit might be derived from them. I complied with his request and only observed that they must be managed with prudence and care, especially the manuscripts. Joseph Coe had loaned $800 towards the purchase of the collection and was hoping to recover some of his investment by charging people to view the mummies and papyri until the translation was completed. John Whitmer, who was appointed by Joseph Smith to be the church historian, as indicated in the Doctrine and Covenants on March 8, 1831, recorded in his diary April of 1835, quote, About the 1st of July, 1835, there came a man having four Egyptian mummies exhibiting them for curiosities, which was a wonder indeed, having also some records connected with them which were found deposited with the mummies. But there being no unskilled in the Egyptian language, therefore could not translate the record. After this exhibition, Joseph the seer saw the records, and by the rev revelation of Jesus Christ could translate these records, which gave an account of our forefathers, much of which was written by Joseph of Egypt, who was sold by his brethren, which when translated, will be a pleasing history and of great value to the saints. An article written by Oliver Cowdery regarding the purchase was also printed in the Messenger and Advocate, the church newspaper in Kirtland. He explained in the article about how the mummies and papyri came into the church's possession. He also stated that he believed once they were translated that they would become additional scriptures added to the current canon at the time. The article read, if providence permits, I will ere long write you again upon the propriety of looking for additions to our present scriptures according to their own literal reading. Joseph planned to finish and publish the Book of Abraham in 1837, but encountered a lot of problems in Kirtland that took him away from the translation process. Then the saints were run out of Kirtland in 1838 and many headed for Missouri. Little, if anything, was accomplished on the papyri during the Missouri period, and things finally started to slow down when they came to Nauvoo. In June of 1840, Joseph asked the Nauvoo High Council to relieve him of some of his administrative duties so he could focus on the translation and other spiritual matters. His request for relief of duties was as follows. That the church having erected an office where he can attend the affairs of the church without distraction he thinks and very verily believes that the time has now come when he should devote himself exclusively to those things which relate to the spiritualities of the church and commence the work of translating the Egyptian records. Sometime before the spring of 1838, probably late 1837, at least some of the papyri were cut up, pasted onto paper, and some mounted under glass and frames. 
Presumably, this was a way to preserve the papyri, as continuous unrolling and handling of ancient scrolls would take a toll. Papyrus fragments 1 and 2 suffered damage, and patches had begun to fall off. At least 47 of these patches were pasted onto separate and unrelated areas on papyrus fragments 4, 5, 8, 9, and 10. These images show the backs of the paper on which the fragments were glued. Notice that some have maps of Kirtland and plans for constructing the temple as they use various sources of paper to attempt to preserve the integrity of the papyri. Joseph spent some time working on the translation without scribes. This document was written in his own handwriting. He would draw an Egyptian character from the papyrus on the left side and then give a meaning on the right. In some instances, he was indicating the sound the character made, and in some he indicated the character's meaning. He appeared to be making a, or creating a key that could be used while translating the document as a point of reference. There were at least four scribes that helped Joseph on the translation of the Book of Abraham. There, were four original, there are four original manuscripts today written in the handwriting of Frederick G. Williams, Warren Parrish, Willard Richards, and W. W. Phelps. It is believed that another was created in Kirtland but did not survive, or at least has not been found and made public. In March of 1842, Joseph Smith, who was the editor of the Times and Seasons, began publishing installments of the Book of Abraham, along with illustrations known as facsimiles, copied from the papyri. This sample is taken from the second installment, which was printed in the March 15, 1842 issue of the Times and Seasons, which included a printed facsimile of one of the Egyptian texts. The Times and Seasons article in the LDS Book of Abraham de detail the meaning and of the characters in the facsimile. The collection was moved to the Nauvoo Mansion House in 1843. Visitors to Nauvoo could see the artifacts when visiting there. One visitor noted the following account of seeing the collection. There were some pine presses fixed against the wall of the room. These receptacles Smith opened and disclosed four human bodies, shrunken and blacked with age. These are mummies, said the exhibitor, and I want you to look at that little runt of a fellow over there. He was a great man in his day. Why, that was Pharaoh ne Necho, king of Egypt. Some parchments inscribed with hieroglyphics were then offered us. They were preserved under glass and handled with great respect. This is the handwriting of Abraham, the father of the faithful, said the prophet. This is the autograph of Moses, and these lines were written by his brother Aaron. Here we have the earliest account of the creation from which Moses composed the first book of Genesis. These claims, of course, could not be correct, as Abraham and Moses were separated by almost 600 years, and therefore could not have authored the same documents. Following Joseph's murder at Carthage, Illinois, the mummies remained for several years in the possession of Lucy Mack Smith, who continued to exhibit them throughout Illinois. She charged a small fee for the privilege of seeing the mummies, and thus the few coins she made were used for her keep. Lucy Mack died in 1856, and the mummies, together with the papyri, became the property of Emma Smith, the prophet's widow, who sold them in just a few weeks after Lucy's death to a man named Abel Combs. Notice the painting in the middle showing Lucy Mack Smith with a picture of facsimile one in the background. Mr. Combs did not hold on to the mummies very long. He immediately sold two of them, along with some papyri, to Edward Wyman, owner of Wyman's Hall, a museum in St. Louis. The mummies were on exhibit with the hieroglyphic writings at the museum. Soon the mummies were sold again, this time to Colonel John H. Wood. Colonel Wood put them in his museum in Chicago. His museum was full of oddities and mystical items. It also had a theater and put on dramatic productions. It was believed that the papyri and mummies were lost in the great fire that destroyed most of the city of Chicago in October of 1871. After the fire, it was assumed that all the papyri sources for the book had been lost. Unbeknownst to most, Abel Combs still owned several papyri fragments and two of the mummies, the latter of which have disappeared. The papyri were given to Combs' nurse, Charlotte Weaver, upon his death on July 5th of 1892, who in turn gave them to her daughter, Alice Huser. A 1918 memorandum from the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art records that Huser brought the eight or ten fragments of papyri in for inspection. 
Then in late 1945, a curator at the museum noticed the memorandum and tracked down Huser's widow, Edward Huser, making an offer for purchase of the papyri, which was accepted in 1946. The items were then displayed in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art in their Egyptian section. In 1966, the museum offered to sell the papyri to the LDS Church. The LDS acquired the fragments in November of 1967. Since that time, they have been debated and studied heavily. They are now housed in the LDS Church archives in Salt Lake City, Utah. Since the death of Joseph Smith in 1844, the LDS have regarded the Book of Abraham as sacred. The church republished it in England in 1851 as part of a pamphlet entitled The Pearl of Great Price. The Pearl of Great Price was officially canonized in 1880, making the Book of Abraham scripture for the church. There have been additions and subtractions to the original Book of Abraham portion of the Pearl of Great Price, but the majority of what Joseph Smith published in 1842 remains. The Book of Abraham was never accepted by most of the other Mormon factions, including the RLDS Church. So here are the facts. Joseph taught that two roles were literally written by the ancient patriarchs Abraham and Joseph. Independent sources have him pointing to places on the papyri and identifying various hieroglyphics as the signature of Abraham. The accounts of, from eyewitnesses consistently maintain that Joseph presented the mummies as those of a pharaoh and his royal household. Most commonly, Joseph and his mother Lucy Mack referred to them as Pharaoh Onatus, his, his wife and their two daughters, one of whom was named Katumin. They claim these names were obtained through revelation. Lucy Mack Smith would sometimes refer to one of the mummies as Pharaoh's daughter, the one who saved Moses. One eyewitness wrote that he was told that Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's name was Necho. Multiple leaders of the early church regarded the Book of Abraham as holy, including Joseph Smith, W.W. Phelps, Oliver Cowdery, F.G. Williams, Warren Parrish, John Whitmer, and others. There are 11 surviving fragments from the rolls. They are deemed by scholars as authentic Egyptian papyri. The Book of Abraham was canonized by the LDS Church as part of the Pearl of Great Price and is considered by the LDS as scripture. Over the years, there has been some disagreement about whether the papyri owned by the LDS Church today are the original papyri owned by Joseph Smith. Scholars, however, conclude that the recovered papyri are portions of the originals, partly based on the fact that the fragments were pasted onto paper which had drawings of a temple and maps of the Kirtland, Ohio area on the back, and were accompanied by an affidavit by Emma Smith stating that they had been in the possession of Joseph Smith. So now we are faced with several questions. Were the artifacts truly part of a collection of writings from Abraham and Joseph? Did Joseph Smith receive prophetic direction in their interpretation, or was he deceived by the evil one? Should these writings have become scripture, or just left behind in history like the RLDS Church did in not adopting the book? Was Emma Smith aware that they were not from God and this led her to sell the collection two weeks after Lucy Mack Smith passed away? At the time of publication of the Book of Abraham in 1842, modern archaeologists and Egyptologists were not able to read ancient Egyptian. The Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799 and was the first time that ancient Egyptian text appeared next to Greek. Since Greek was a known language, scholars were able to compare the Greek translation to the, of the text to the Egyptian characters and develop a method of reading ancient Egyptian. They could read very basic Egyptian words by 1822, but it wasn't until the 1850s that they could read the entire text of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Because of this, scholars in Joseph's day could not verify Joseph's translation of the papyrus until long after his death. This papyrus fragment, which is now in two pieces, comes from the Book of Breathing for Horos. Many Egyptologists interpret the vignette on the right piece as the reanimation of a corpse by the god Anubis. The left piece bears some introductory material and in parts of paragraphs 1 through 3 from the Book of Breathing for Horos 
which are spells for the reanimation of the deceased and the purification of the body. These were common writings included with mummies as a blessing to the dead and to provide instruction into the afterlife. They make no reference to Abraham or Joseph. A number of characters from this papyrus fragment were copied onto the Egyptian alphabet documents, also onto the Grammar and Alphabet volume, and also the Kirtland era manuscripts of the Book of Abraham. The vignette was published as facsimile one in the March 1st, 1842 edition of the Times and Seasons in Nauvoo and explained in detail. Notice these two figures. The one on the left was completed by either Joseph Smith or Reuben Headlock, the engraver, depicting a man holding a knife, presumably Abraham being sacrificed by the priest of Elkanah mentioned in the Book of Abraham. It was published in the Times and Seasons and in the Pearl of Great Price. The image on the right is a more likely depiction of the missing pieces, according to modern Egyptologists. This part of the scroll is definitely part of the Book of Abraham scroll. Due to the picture shown matching draw, showing matching drawings published by the church in the Times and Seasons, Mormon and non-Mormon scholars agree that this picture is a depiction found in the Book of Breathings, depicting an Egyptian reanimation by the god Anubis. These scrolls were common items left with mummies to assist them into the afterlife. Mormon scholars maintain that the writings of Abraham are not found anywhere on the 11 fabric, fragments and have determined that Joseph Smith must have interpreted the book of Abraham from the portions lost in the Chicago fire, and hence there is no way to verify their authenticity. The image on the right is a common scene in Egyptian art, which portrays the resurrection of Osiris by Anubis. Osiris is lying on the couch, the lion couch, awaiting resurrection. The image on the left also most likely represented the resurrection of Osiris by Anubis. Notice the same lion couch, the, the figure laying on the bed, and the head being drawn incorrectly uh, of Anubis. The early church filled in the human head on the papyrus and said it depicted Abraham being put on the altar by the priest of El Elkanah to sacrifice him to the Egyptian gods. The bird in the right corner was to depict the Holy Spirit. Another issue that arises is the dating of the fragments. Based on where they were found and the writings found on them, the mummies are not believed to have been pharaohs but actually priests and nobles from the Ptolemaic era of Egypt, around 320 to up to 30 BC. No known pharaohs or their family members have names that resemble Onidas or Kataman. A pharaoh Necho was known to have existed. However, he was buried in Sais, near the Nile Delta, far from where the mummies were excavated. Abraham dates back another 1800 years before these artifacts to around 2000 BC. These papyri definitely do not date back to this period, nor do they date back to Joseph or Moses. These fragments bear portions of chapters 53 and 54 on the upper right hand fragment, and portions of chapters 57, 63, 65, 67, 70, and 72, and possibly chapter 59 on the L-shaped fragment. And these are all out of the Book of the Dead for Semenes. According to Egyptologists, these spells were intended to ensure food, water, and breath for the dead, as well as free movement from between the tomb, the underworld, selected sacred sites, and the earth in general. The backing also bears one small scrap of papyrus containing portions of chapters 75, 76, and 77 of the Book of the Dead for Semenes. These, none of these uh, scraps had anything to do with Abraham or Joseph. So what does the Book of Abraham actually contain? It has five chapters and three facsimiles with explanations of the meanings of each. The book starts out detailing Abraham's early life. He shares that he desired to be righteous and become a prince of peace, and God made him a rightful heir, a priest, a high priest holding the right belonging to the fathers. He said he desired to be in the priesthood. He preached to his fathers and they rejected the truth and worshiped other gods. They worship the god of Elkanah, the god of Libna, the god of Machmarah, the god of Korash, the god of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They even sacrificed their children to these gods. They sacrificed them near a place called Potiphar's Hill at the head of the plain of Olishim. Then, then Abraham's god spoke to him and said his name was Jehovah. 
he sent him to a promised land with Lot. A lot of the language and doctrine appear similar to biblical texts, with the exception of the names of all the gods. None of the Egyptian gods listed appear anywhere in Egyptology. The remainder of the book speaks about the creation, emphasizes priesthood authority, and the Godhead. Facsimile 1 was labeled by Joseph and was included in the Times and Seasons. The LDS Church also included this diagram with, with the uh, corresponding labeling in the Pearl of Great Price. The labeled parts of the facsimile do not match the interpretation by modern Egyptologists. One key doctrinal issue in the Book of Abraham is its reference to the two gods. It is referring to Jesus and God as the two gods. While this could be explained by saying that God and Jesus are one, and thus each is a god, it does not agree with the message of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon indicates that there is one God, and he took upon him flesh and is called Jesus. Mosiah chapter 8 says, And now Abinadi saith unto them, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people, and because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, and being the Father and the Son, the Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son, because he because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son, and they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and of earth. The Bible also indicates that there is only one God and none beside him. So here's the conclusions. The Book of Abraham is not a translation of the papyri. The Book of Abraham is not a record of Abraham or of Joseph. The Book of Abraham is not the Word of God. The Book of Abraham is not consistent with the Book of Mormon. The Book of Abraham is simply proof that Joseph Smith was a fallible human being. And the Book of Abraham is also proof that not everything Joseph Smith said or did was correct. According to his journal entry on October 29, 1842, Joseph told a congregation that he was but a man and that they must not expect him to be perfect. If they expected him to be perfect, then he should expect it of them. While we believe Joseph Smith was a seer and used by God to bring forth the Book of Mormon, he was not perfect. The Book of Abraham is a perfect example of the frailty of man and what can happen to any one of us if we are not humble and right with God. We hold no ill will towards Joseph Smith or any other church leaders of the early restoration movement. We simply desire to know the truth about who we are, where we came from, and where we are going.